Today, we talk with self-proclaimed automation mega-nerds. Welcome to The Friday Habit with Benjamin Manley and Mark Labriola II. The Friday Habit is for creators, entrepreneurs, and agency owners looking for actionable ideas on how to grow their business and be more profitable. We'll pull from our combined knowledge of over 20 years and interview thought leaders that will inspire you and give you the motivation you need to kick your business into high gear. Buckle up. It's Friday. And welcome to the Friday Habit. And today uh, we... Ben and I are so excited to uh, interview our guests, but I'll uh, introduce one of our guests. Uh, his name is Sam Ovett. He's a professional guide turned automation mega nerd. Uh, he's the co-founder of Mobile Pocket Office and is leading the way to help new and established business augment their human and technological resources to leverage growth and streamline productivity. So that's Sam. Welcome to the show, Sam. And and we got a, this was like a Twix episode, you know, like a surprise. We got Sam's business partner and uh, father, Josh. Welcome to the show. We're excited. Hey, I'm going to correct you on one thing. It's Ovet, not Ovet, but that's no big deal. Just that way people know. All right. Um, that's right. We're excited to Ovet like Corvette. You know? Get a bit of you. <laughs> we're excited to be here, you know, share some stuff. Hopefully people can walk away with some things they can use. Yeah. And that's what we're all about. We're all about, you know, um, having great conversations, but then also, um, having some takeaways that we can take back and, 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 um, you know, focus on, on growing our businesses. So yep. I have an icebreaker question I could kick mm -hmm. off with. Let's do it. All right. This is for both of you. Would you rather be able to play any instrument or speak any language? I, I would rather be able to speak any language. I'm thinking about why. You know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> See, I I, why I, this I think, is uh, this is my thought. Is this? I would rather play any instrument because music is a universal language, right? Oh, so it's like snap. if you're trying to communicate with somebody like in China, you'd be like, let me grab some of these strings and you start playing like Van Halen on these like strings. People are going to be like, whoa. Is that how you're going to order Chinese food? Because I'm not sure if that's going to work. <laughs> There's a the practical side of it, it sounds well, like. And then the <laughs> I got you all beat. I can play multiple instruments already and I can only speak two languages. But only one of them very good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, language, I think would be like a really... I think language is the practical one, and then and then like the romantic one is the uh, the the instruments. I'll add a twist. If I was traveling, I would rather have the languages. But given the current <laughs> take the instrument, That's I, right. I would yeah. take the instrument. I mean, I feel I can kind of get by with all those like you know, Google translate apps where you can point your phone at a sign and it translates it live for yeah. you. I mean, sure. I'll be a, that annoying, annoying tourist that doesn't speak the language, but I think I can get around. I would love to be able to play <laughs> like, um, you know, like a violin or a cello or something. That's what I would pick. Hey, you know what, you know what the interesting thing about having, having being able to play multiple instruments? You can entertain yourself. You're not going <laughs> to talk to yourself. In You're like Dick Van Dyke <laughs> over here. Like, you know, playing the, <laughs> <laughs> playing the drum. What, what instruments do you play, Josh? I play trumpet, trombone, clarinet, oh. saxophone, piano. <laughs> nice. Wow. Um, you know, uh, uh, French horn. Um, so yeah, I I did a lot of the, and and when I was when I was a kid, I actually had a band and I would switch it between trumpet and te and and tenor sax. It wasn't a ska band. Was it? Well, the, the, the challenge was is our sax player never showed up on time or sometimes didn't show up. And we had some really cool, you know, numbers we played. Yeah. And so, you know, I'd lead the show with, you know, a trumpet was great, you know, and then a, a flugelhorn. And, you know, where's where's the sexy music with the with the saxophone? I was like, okay, I got to we'll play that. Too. It's like we're playing Careless Whispers tonight. <laughs> Josh, get on the sax, <laughs> and you're never gonna dance again. <laughs> See, I told uh, you you'd be entertaining. Yeah, <laughs> solid. Well, hey, you know, give us. I, I want to get to know the the two of you a little bit better and kind of hear your origin story. Um, kind of hear about uh, you know, where you guys came from, how you you know developed your your business idea. And, and Sam, I, you know, it, it sounds to me, you know, reading some of your bio and stuff like that, that you're, you're pretty active outdoorsy kind of guy. 
And uh, you, there was a lot of in your bio about you being a guide and a kayaking athlete and all this kind of stuff. So um, maybe maybe what we could do is, is start with you kind of maybe where you came from up until this point. And then, Josh, maybe I want to kind of hear some of your story, too, of, you know, where you came from up until the point where you guys decided to, you know, start a business. I can't, originally I was born in Brooklyn, so that's where I came from. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good story. And I, I put it there because um, I thought it was interesting. It's a little bit different and it's a not, you know, it's not like a normal, maybe it's not normal, maybe it is. Who knows what normal is? We're going to throw normal out the window. But the idea that there's a lot of parallels that come from the the time that I spent as a professional athlete and guide into the world of business. And so I and Josh will have some fun things to, to pop in here with because, you know, he's my father. And so I, I grew up and like, all I wanted to do was like go play outside and do outdoor stuff. And that was the primary thing. And so I went to school, I got a degree in environmental science. And as Josh will tell you, when I was in college, I would, I would go to school like three days a week because I jammed all my classes together. And then I would guide and uh, do adventures the on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And, um, and so that was my thing and I was really into it. And, you know, I had the, the fortunate, um, upbringing to be around Josh, who was always, you know, he always, I mean, since ever, since I was like remembered stuff, you always had your own business. Um, and so I was always raised in that environment of entrepreneurship, but my version of it early on was like, I want to go forge a path in the world of whitewater and that's my thing. That's what I want to do. And I did it. And so, and then after college, I moved to the mountains of, of uh, Western North Carolina and spent a lot of time guiding up there and paddling and being part of the teams. But that was also, funnily enough, my introduction to the world of marketing and also opened my eyes to the failures of marketing because it turns out that when you are, so there's kind of a couple of things that I pulled and I always tell people like, if you're paying attention to what you're doing, there's probably a lot of parallels in your life that you can draw and bring over. So if true. you're not paying attention, yep. then yeah, you're going to miss all that stuff. Um, and, and go like, well, oh, this is so different than that. And it's like, well, actually, maybe it's not, maybe there's some lessons to be learned. Um, but with that, there's a couple of things there. One is from the guiding standpoint, outside of being a professional sponsored athlete, uh, the guiding side of things, there's a lot of risk management. There's a lot of communication with people. There's a lot of logistics and there's, and people can actually die because you're taking people down hazardous whitewater. Um, and, and like, and unfortunately, like just to set the stage, like I've dealt with death in that realm and with what we do now, nobody dies. It's pretty easy. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's a lot of livelihoods on the line yep. with people's businesses, but, but people don't, people don't die quickly overnight type of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember Sam said somebody died in the river and I tried to resuscitate them. And I said, OK, we're driving up to take you out the dinner because you're probably all freaked yeah. out. Yeah. And so, you know, hey, these people just want to go down a, a, a boat ride down the river. Luckily, it wasn't Sam's boat. So I didn't have any comment on that one. But he was the Eagle Scout with the skills and the and the, and the knowledge to take action. And he took the evasive action and made sure everybody else self and then, you know, dealt with, you know, ambulances, doctors, helicopters, all that good stuff that comes with somebody in the middle of nowhere, you know, drowning. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So not to like push that off, but the bigger picture here is that there's risk and you have to manage that risk and that practice of risk management and going, if I do X, what's my potential outcome? And what are the downsides and how do I protect them? What are the measures I can take to protect that? How can I train myself so that I understand the realities of the risks that I'm taking? How can I set it up so that I can reduce the risk? And these can apply in business just the same. People have heard of the idea of protecting your downside. That's all it is. It's this idea of risk management. And with what we do with people's business and automation and process and growing business, there's a lot of opportunity to, to completely blow up a business and destroy it overnight. And so yeah. we look at those and we take a guided perspective of working with someone and then we look at all the risk. So that's the translation of that. And we'll we can get into it some more. But the other translation is like 
is the failure of marketing, which is what I call it, <laughs> like the marketing failure. As a professional athlete, mm-hmm. guess what? You may be physically in shape and capable, but you're a line item on somebody's marketing budget. That's the bottom line, you know? And depending yeah. on the uh, the nature of the sport, you're a bigger line item or you're a smaller line item. Um, and that's kind of the bottom line. So that was my my real raw introduction to the world of marketing because – Hi, welcome to the team. Now you're going to sit down with the marketing director. And and as when you sit down with that marketing director, they want to know how much social media you can generate on your own for them. I don't know how good athletes you are. What can you do to make the number, the likes go up and the interest go up and the sales go up? Yeah. And so like that's the difference. You know, there is the level of, of athlete that's performing at the Olympic level. They are also doing that same game, but there's a little bit difference there because it's, but it's not much. At the end of the day, uh, very few athletes outside of the sports like that that we think of as mainstream sports, you know, NBA, football, most athletes that you see on social media in the adventure sports world, they're not making much money, you know, but the company is trying to figure out, hey, this person is doing something publicly that is garnering attention and they're able to, you know, they they meet the standards physically of what they're capable of doing to call them an athlete. And outside of that, it's, Hey, how many boats or paddles or whatever it is, can they, can they sell for us is the bottom line. And so when hmm. you look at what was done, it's like, it's literally a numbers game of marketing. And that was my introduction to the world of marketing. And also where I started to realize all the marketing around me, and then just understanding process from growing up around Josh, who's always done some kind of process, and then being introduced to marketing automation because I was like, oh, well, how can I automate certain things in the social media world? And that opens up a whole wide world of automation. And hmm. if it's interesting to you, then you start to go down that path. Um, yeah. When it, and when your pocket jingles when you do it, it even makes it better. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so the more I do, like the more money I'd make as an athlete, but ultimately it wasn't that much money. And like, here's a funny statement. We were in the airport about to head down to Ecuador. Um, and, and I'm like sitting there with a kayak, you know, and going down, we were going to be part of this, uh, like this, one of the cities in Ecuador was sponsoring an expedition to promote tourism in their town. So we were going to go down there and uh, you know, document this whole thing. And then they were going to promote it. And the reality is like, wasn't much money compared to the world that we are in now at all. You know, right. it was like, yeah. like here's some change. And, and the, uh, there was a <laughs> professor a for a long time. <laughs> yeah. And it was great. I don't regret any of those, <laughs> you know, experiences. I would do it over again. Um, and I mean, that's why I have like, there's, you know, a line of skis on the wall. I'm like eight miles from there, a ski resort and backcountry. And, you know, this is like a rock face that's about 30 minutes from our house, the trailhead for that. So I, I still participate as an athlete. Um, I just am my own sponsor now and it's like a lot better sponsorship. <laughs> 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 but right. that said, uh, I'll, let me wrap up the story because I think it's interesting. And this is kind of the, the turning point in my mind to say, I got to do something else and i'm all these things are opening up in my mind which is i'm about to head down to ecuador i'm sitting in the airport and this guy who is a professor an agricultural professor is with a group of students and they you know they have this giant kayak and they're like well what are you, what are you doing with that you know I'm like oh yeah going down to ecuador we're gonna do some first descents and you know go off these waterfalls and film it and and i don't know why he said this but he's like oh, so what do you do for a living? You know? <laughs> and, and I was like, well, that's what I do. He's like, well, you can't eat your kayak, you know, the agricultural guy. And I was kind of like, well, fuck you, you know, is what my first thought was. <laughs> and, and then over time that kind of sunk in and I was like, you know, I, I think I can make a lot more money here doing stuff. And that was where I was like, we merged. So that was the beginning of the discussion and development into the world of let's merge this idea of all the marketing stuff that I'm seeing with the process stuff that Josh had done for years. And Hey, it turns out there's a whole world of like marketing and sales automation, you know, and Josh, you were aware mm, of it, yeah. but like you really did stuff on the business analytics side for years. 
and process. Yeah. So Josh, stuff, tell us, so. Josh, tell us a little bit about where you came from. I mean, so you're, you're, no, that's where that merge starts to happen. You know, Josh is, is hanging out in Brooklyn, just gangster with like Jay Z and like all these people. Um, <laughs> Burning, cutting down the neighbor's bushes. So, like yeah, all these, yeah, I got, I got tired of the <laughs> There was bushes back then. We have time for today, but I, I started off from Brooklyn and wound up in South Florida, and then now I'm here in Atlanta. So, you know, um, I've just been out of my native habitat for a long time. But And I currently live in Colorado, just yeah. so everybody knows. So like, okay, you're, you're a, a local Coloradan then. I, are you in Colorado? I, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm right down in Littleton. Oh, I'm up in Netherlands. Okay, sweet. Come on up the canyon. <laughs> All right, yeah, it's it's beautiful. It's, yeah, Ben actually, we do a business retreat every year, and he came out. We went up uh, to Lake Dillon and yeah. uh, sp- spent some time up there doing some business uh, stuff. So, yeah, it's it's I love Colorado. It's awesome. But but Josh, so tell us a little bit about your journey, about you know how you kind of got to where you are today. Um, kind of some of your, your history and, and all well, that. We're a big family from the outdoors. My father was always a big my, – all my family has been in big outdoors – um, Sam went to school three days a week in college. I did the same thing, only I, I majored on the th- those other days in uh, sailing and um, uh, skiing, not, you know, on, uh, on, a, on the back of a powerboat. So, okay, you know, nice. I spent Friday, Saturday, Sunday on the lake, and, you know, then the rest of the day was school. So, um, and then I had a various things I did in school, et cetera. But long story short is I learned how to sell. And I learned, I was also in risk management and I got in the insurance industry. So, um, I've got various sales experience from that perspective, but then I found one of the, one, I had a job for about eight years of my entire life of 40 some odd years of working. Um, so I really don't know what it's like to work for somebody much. I'm not a very good employee, but that's not, so. <laughs> None of us are. Once you start working for yourself, you're like, ah, well, I take too- I'm, I'm damaged goods. <laughs> no, no, no. I take too much time off and I challenge everybody's ideas. So, uh, okay. You know, I can get more done in a few minutes. You know, I want to be the most automated man in the world. I don't want to do yeah. anything, you know? Working smarter, not harder. That's right. You know, uh, I, my, my thought, my model is that the best business model is the one that doesn't need you. <laughs> yep. So, you know, I tell all the people who work for us, my, your job is to eliminate your job. Yeah, you know, not fire you, but so you can do other things. Like do things yeah. that you have to talk to people and make things happen. But as far as you know, if it's A or B, whatever. So long story short, from a background perspective, um, I spent a lot of my I spent years in. I ha, I am a certified total quality management guy, uh, engineering um, processes like TQM and also lean manufacturing. And, you know, a lot in manufacturing, you know, I worked in insurance and risk management. I built sales teams and sales forces. Um, Then I got into technology and I started building, you know, the original one I'm talking about when it was about contact management, when it was DOS, early 80s. Okay. Oh, yeah. I started writing some software to manage it. You know, you heard a program called ACT, you know, long term. I, I started automating companies, brick and mortar companies, so they could work as a sales team and a customer service team. And then I worked my way up to where I was dealing with Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000 companies, uh, primarily in the, in the Department of Defense government contractors. Um, I'm also part of the National Defense Industrial Association. I spent a lot of time in the IT business, but everything centers around um, Eliminating repetitive work that can be done by a computer, all right, 24 by 7, and doesn't take a vacation, doesn't get sick, doesn't break down other than you unplug the power. So, you know, there's a lot of business experience and consulting that we do. Um, You know, as I tell people, are you successful enough to go take a trip to the Amazon, spend six weeks without communications with your business, and double your business while you're there? Okay. Last year, I took six weeks off, turned off my phone. I know how many people did that last year, and our business grew. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we're big fans of Mike Mikowitz, and he has a, a book out there called Clockwork, um, which is all about uh, you know automating your business, and you know the goal is to like be able to take four weeks off uh, and not 
you know, have anybody contact you. Yeah. Th- this week I want to follow my, my mentor is Dan Sullivan of the strategic coach. I paid him a quarter million dollars over the years, 17 weeks a year. He's taken off for 50 years. Wow. And he's coached 40,000 awesome. entrepreneurs. Wow. He just came out with a book, right? Uh, it's called, uh, um, I'll come back to that. But the, it was so good. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Googling it right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the outcome, I mean, Josh, the outcome was what you do, you know, and what we do, like you, you, you literally practice it. So like, you don't even have to talk about the book cause you do it. Right. Like, <laughs> First hand experience, you know, and the low, yeah. The idea is how do you innovate, delegate, extricate yourself. All right automate the rest and then go live mm-hmm. that's yeah, I, awesome. that's ideal when you spell it out um yeah so the idea here is if you practice it you know what can you do and you have to take a critical you know it's really easy to be complex but it takes a lot of work to be simple i'll mm-hmm. let you ask the question since you're the host <laughs> yeah well i was just curious uh you know this idea of business process mapping and, and, you know, how you incorporate marketing into that. Let me jump, let's jump into that and start from a little bit from the top and like why you would do it in the first place. Right. Yeah. Cause it's like, what's the point, you know, there's all these techniques and tools and blah, blah, blah. But if there's no point behind it and it just sucks up your time and you have a lame outcome, then you probably shouldn't do it. So yeah. with this, it's all about starting from the top and going, what's, what's, the outcome that you're trying to achieve as with your business. And the focus we have is exactly what Josh was talking about there, right? Is that idea that, and you can say it again, Josh, that ideal statement. That's innovate, delegate, extricate, automate, and live. Yeah. Hmm. So if that's the outcome that you want with the business, and even if that's not the outcome, you just want to grow your business is going to help you do it too, because it's going to give you the ability to scale stuff which is a popular word. And a lot of people scale with humans versus technology. And there's a lot of opportunity that's missed and human error that's created when you do that. Um, so if you want to grow your business past a certain point, over 100,000, you know, if you're at 100, 150,000, you're, you're, you're a small business and you, are, you have a job that you can't leave. But if you're scaling to any amount and you want to be a seven figure, eight figure or pick a number that's large, you're going to have to have infrastructure and management in place to handle these things. It just doesn't happen. And, and it also, right. all those things cost money. OK, you know, there, there are things that that, that uh, eat while you sleep, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. OK, yep. those are the worst things, but the ones that eat more than they need to. You know, you're going. You're not making any money unless you have got it organized and you got it systematized, and you have people who know exactly what to do and they do it well. So when you're mapping out your business, you're trying to figure out how to do things in as much a straight line as possible, right? And there's one thing that I learned a long time ago. It kills every business. We always have done it that way. Those are the words. That's the way, you know, and so when you train people, when people put in processes as a smaller business, they grow, they put these layers of automation and process and rules and regulations, right? But very rarely did they go back like an onion and peel it back and take away all the excess. Um, I'll give you a case in point, very easy one. I was one one of the, one of my customers is one of the major carpet manufacturers in the world here out of Georgia. And one day I did a project when, 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 you know, over a couple of years to the projects, projects. But, uh, you know, one of the things I was watching this guy walk up and down every day, I was there for like a month. Every day I watched this guy walk up and down the halls with a, with a cart full of boxes of paper. So I decided to follow him one morning and he was dropping the boxes off in each of the offices. And so after he dropped the box off, I'd walk in and say to the executive, the guy who whoever's in the office, what do you do? What's that for? He says, oh, I think they're reports. And he tells the guy, just put them over in the corner on the top of the other reports. I said, do you actually use those? Said, nah, everything I don't use on the computer. So he's got this guy who's walking around with literally bankers' boxes of reports that he's printed off all night long and put some in people's offices. And I said, I got a question for you, Joe. 
Why did you still do this? And this guy's, you know, in the 70s. You know, he's just kind of retiring, whatever. He says, well, that's what I've done for 30 years. Nobody told me to stop. <laughs> so, you know, one of my reports at the end of the week with the executive committee said, I'm going to save you $1,000 a week in paper costs. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you're, if you're a business owner and that kind of stuff is happening and you have blind spots to it, how do you identify those things when, like, maybe he's blind to it because he's just always done that way? Like, how do people know that's happening to them? My secret weapon. Really? All right. Secret. I'm ready. It's called a fresh pair of eyes. Mm. Okay. So a fresh pair of eyes is a consultant. I walk mm-hmm. in and I have no preconceptions. I teach me how to do the, the jobs around here. As right? if you're as if you're trying to train me to do them, and you're and I'm a brand new employee. I'm a brand new employee. Mm-hmm. Just tell me what to do, and I'm going to actually do them. You know, I'll help somebody out, but I'm going to do them. And I'm looking and going, and then any employee that comes in, if they're of value, they're going to go. You know, this is a waste of time. You can instead of doing this, you can do this, and you don't need this. But they are most employees, right, or team members. Don't ask questions. They do what they're told, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? This Their biggest is the concern is not getting fired right away when it right. when right. really they right. every new employee is is old. I won't say as good as a as hiring a, a sharp consultant to look at this, but if they're given the communication that says, "Hey, yeah, the permission that says, "Hey, yeah. ask why," <laughs> and we mm-hmm. want to write all this down, that's the fastest way to find out, and it's not. Yeah. It's not from the people who've been there because anybody who's been there longer than a uh, year, maybe two years, mm-hmm. and they're doing stuff repeatedly, they've hit the patterns. There's, they, they're, they're no longer looking at it with, with fresh eyes. And management mm-hmm. doesn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've told them a bunch of times, but, you know, we could save $1,000 a week if we just used this, did it this way, mm-hmm. but they don't want to listen. Is there anything um, you recommend culture-wise that's like, hey, these are the types of things as a business that you should do ongoing so this doesn't happen to people again and they need to hire another consultant in five, 10 years? Or is it always is that the answer always to have a fresh pair of eyes? Or is there something that business owners and employees can do on an ongoing basis to help prevent some of that? Yes. Two things, okay? One comes from an over 50-year-old methodology called Kaizen, Okay. comes from the Japanese, and it means continuous improvement. Okay, That means you only want, always want to find better ways to do things because you're always changing. The market's changing. What can you do better? You can apply that to anything. Okay, And the other part, the other Japanese word that's part of Kaizen, it's, there's several pieces to it, so I'm, not, I'm just giving you the, the meat and potatoes that we teach people at a mid-sized business owner, the things you can do. It's called poker yolk, and that's not got nothing to do with eggs. Poker means mistake, and yolk means proof. Mistake, proof. Okay? You know, there's a book about rework that's been written. You know, rework, bad returns. Um, if you have, if you make mistakes, there's a cost to it. M- meaning, the customer's unhappy, the product breaks, you get returns. Um, I'll give you an interesting one. Uh, one of my customers was the largest garbage manufacturing manu- uh, uh, companies in the world. And I spent a month in, in, uh, in Scotland do- observing some things and building some systems, technology systems. And I was doing some analytics and I noticed that this is because I was playing with the numbers and working with my team and said, you know, what are we seeing in this pattern of numbers that we're pulling out of all the manufacturing systems? And, when, and Walter says, you know what? There's a problem. There's a problem. There's all the, the trucks that are manufactured on line four coming out on Fridays after two o'clock seems to have a lot of leaks that come back in. These are $100,000 plus trucks and they leak. And, they're all, and then when they bring them back to fix them, they're offline for weeks being repaired. And they have to provide a loaner truck, right? So it's expensive, especially if it's under warranty. So we started digging into data and started doing some reporting. And we found out that it was position six on line four after two that caused all these things. And I went to the manager and I said, who works on position six after two o'clock on that shift? Oh, you know, that's, that's, that's Joey, whatever his name is. I don't remember. 
They said, you know that he has cost you $6 million a year in leaky parts and, and overhead? What? He says, yeah, all the trucks that leak that come back for repair are come off of his line. Wow. And here was the bottom line of it. When we all sat down and had a beer and talked about it, he says, Joey has a drinking problem. And he shouldn't be at work. But he's the best mechanic we have when he's sober. All right? And guess what? I said, you know what? You should give Joey Friday afternoons off. It'll save you $6 million. And give him a <laughs> bonus, too. <laughs> for staying home. <laughs> okay? Right. Or buy his liquor for him and get him off the job after lunch. You know? Wow. Huh. You, you, so... This is what you, when you, this, again, I'm looking at what's causing the loss of revenue, yeah. what's causing re- re- rework, what's causing delays, right? And, and they never caught that because they weren't maybe measuring? Or why do you think they, were, they never caught that? Nobody ever really went and looked at why. Well, the first thing was I asked stupid questions. I said, <laughs> I said, you guys provide. I mean, this is a conversation that went on for a couple of weeks, you know, over weeks. I said, let me understand this. When a truck breaks down during the first year's warranty, you replace it with a truck. How much does that cost to do that? Well, we take a hundred and twenty thousand dollar asset, we put it out there. It's about two thousand dollars a day. Like, okay, so thirty thousand dollars a month is what you'd normally lease one for, or whatever, whatever that number was. I said, there's an expense. I said, why do the trucks break down? You know, I'm working backwards. Why are you, you know, because we were just looking at managing their, 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 uh, re- their replacement trucks, you know. And so I said, okay, let's go back. Why do they break down? Well, we, we, looked, we, we looked at oil leaks. We looked at, I mean, we had another one that was really crazy, okay. There's a big ejector cylinder in a garbage truck to push all that stuff out, right? Those things are $40,000 cylinders, Okay. And then I, I noticed that a lot of those are being replaced, but I saw them being replaced in trucks that were years old and years that were new. And I was like, this is strange. Turns out that when they sold trucks to a large customer and they knew that they could get a replacement under warranty, they would take the new part out of a new one and put it in an old one and then make a claim that the, that, that the, the new one broke. And, you know, hi, the new truck, it broke down. They come out and put it, they actually come out and deliver a new $40,000 cylinder, install it on a warranty. You know, now the cut, you know. And I said, you know, those parts are serialized, aren't they? I said, absolutely. Why don't we start tracking those serial numbers and put them into your system? And if the serial number that the part was, the truck of the VIN number is not matched the part of the serial number, You know, you have a customer relations problem to deal with, okay? There was another $3 million saved by fixing that problem. So you you look at things and say, where are the money issues? All right, we're going to pause this conversation here. Uh, Go to thefridayhabit.com. There you can find show notes for this episode. Uh, There you can also find links to our websites and ways to get in touch. At the bottom of the page, you can download our guide to the Friday Habit System that will show you how to set aside one full day each week dedicated to working on your business instead of in your business. If you're not already, make sure you subscribe. Uh, If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear next week's episode, subscribe so you get notified. Uh, Also, leave us a review in Apple Podcast app uh, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you want to potentially be on one of our episodes uh, with a question you ask us, go ahead and record a quick message in your phone, voice memo, and email it to hello at the Friday Habit.com. Until next time, live every day like it's Friday. <laughs>